Welcome to the podcast, guys. I am your host, Sean Fredmore. Thank you for joining me. It is episode four, Surviving the Cup, wide receiver edition. We got a lot of news coming out of Buffalo, New York, guys, and we're going to kick it off with some current events surrounding Buffalo, New York. My heart is completely broken, and why is it completely broken? I'll tell you why. Last Friday's practice, uh, the red versus blue practice at Highmark Stadium, the scrimmage, I was very excited to see Josh Allen run out of the tunnel wearing a red helmet. That's right, guys. I'm talking about the red helmet that was famous for the Buffalo Bills during the 1990s, the four-year Super Bowl run that was very uh, very popular and well-known during the Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid, uh, Steve Tasker era. Uh, that Those helmets were so beautiful, guys. In my opinion, I think those helmets were the most beautiful helmets of all. So when I saw Josh Allen wear the red helmet this year, I was like, man, I was so ecstatic. And then I was disappointed to find out that, unfortunately, it was just a gag. And I've been waiting almost a year since the NFL had broke news that teams around the league would be allowed to wear an alternate uniform and an alternate helmet. So I was very upset. I was excited. Then I was upset. I was happy. I was let down. Um... A mix of emotions because I'm like, yes, the glory days of the 90s are back. And I'm going to tell you right now, in my opinion, some people would agree with this. Some people would not. The red on red look looked very sharp. Looked very sharp. The only modification I would make to the red helmet is um, instead of having the blue uh, pinstripes go up the middle, I would have white. Because if you're going to do a color rush jersey, the red on red, you got to have the white pinstripes to match the uh, the white on the red jersey. That's just my opinion. I think it would look better. But, unfortunately, it was a gag. And I was so hurt when I found out that it was not going to be happening this year. Maybe next year it'll, it'll happen. The Buffalo Bills will bring back the red helmets. But, Josh Allen, you're going to have to make it out to me this year by winning a Super Bowl. So you better win a Super Bowl, guys. I'm very ex- uh, and, and honestly, this is the year to do it. If I thought last year we had a really good shot to do it, um, Kansas City, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs knocked us out of the playoffs. Unfortunately, in the divisional round, 13 seconds. Yes, nobody likes to talk about it. It stings still to this day. But hey, it was an amazing game. Hats off to both teams. Hats off to the Chiefs for knocking us out of the playoffs. They earned it. We couldn't hold them for 13 seconds, and but this year is a new year, and I really think that Buffalo, of course, if you're looking at the betting odds for Las Vegas lines, and if you pay attention to that stuff, you'll know that the Bills are the odds-on favorite to actually win the Super Bowl this year with a plus 600. Um, and also, if you're looking at the top five defenses around the NFL as well, the Buffalo Bills are ranked number one, and that's the beauty about the Bills' defense. For the past four years, the Bills have had a top five defense. Now, they've slumped down into the top ten here and there. But in the past four years, uh, they've always remained as a top five defense. And look at the guys they have on that team. Of course, they're going to be a top five defense, and they're ranked number one. But that is another uh, episode, and we'll talk about during uh, – we'll talk about the defenses during that episode. But today is episode four. Surviving the Cup, the wide receiver edition. But yes, we're going to get away from the Josh Allen news for the uh, in regards to the, the scrimmage at Highmark Stadium last Friday. But I should say this before we switch topics. It did have a big attendance, re- uh, big attendance record, guys. It had 30, just over 36,000 tickets were sold, which is pretty impressive for a scrimmage because I can remember when I was about 9, 10 years old, my dad would take me out to, at the time, it was known as Ralph Wilson Stadium. Uh, some of it, some people may refer to it as Rich Stadium. Uh, and some of you guys may refer to it as uh, New Era Stadium or Highmark Stadium. But to me, in my heart of hearts, it's always going to be known as the Ralph. And it's going to pain me in four years when they build a new stadium. But hopefully... Uh, Hopefully, it's, it's, it's going to look like a beautiful stadium. I'm fumbling all my words. I apologize. Uh, but I'm very excited for that as well. But 
we're going to uh, turn to a different topic, actually, in regards to current news uh, surrounding Buffalo. And I really wasn't planning on talking about some fallback news. I'm going to take a sip of water, guys. My app is telling me to hydrate. So if you guys got water, drink water. Stay hydrated, guys. It is very hot out here in southwest Missouri. And before I talk about some fallback news, this is a good segue. This episode today is actually brought to you by the 417 Mafia, Buffalo Bills backers out of southwest Missouri. I am proud to say that I'm a co-admin of the page uh, and the group. Wally Charbonneau, big shout out to you. Uh, Christopher James, David Weinstaff, and Matt Puccio. Those guys are the other co-admins and founders of the Buffalo Bills backers. We, of Southwest Missouri, we uh, are doing an amazing job recruiting people to come out and hang out with us and watch Buffalo Bills games. Um, and if you guys haven't done so already, if you guys are not a member, but if you guys are a member and you're following the group page on Facebook, we actually have the entire 2022-2023 NFL season for the Buffalo Bills reserved to watch games at Big Whiskey's in Springfield, Missouri. So come out, join us, beginning August 20th, actually, for the second week of preseason against the Denver Broncos. You guys can come out and meet the uh, the co-founders and the co-admins of, of the other co-admins of the group and have a good time. Great food, great beer, great chicken wings. You got to have your uh, blue cheese with your chicken wings, so get that ranch crap out of here, waiter, if you know what I'm talking about. But... We're a little uh, Italian Mafia style there. But anyways, uh, come out August 20th to uh, Big Whiskeys in Springfield, Missouri. And if you want to join our group, join our group. We're always taking new members and new listeners to the podcast. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but yeah, we're going to go back to some fallback news. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I don't think it was necessarily a bad deal that was done. I'm talking about uh, our fullback, Reggie Gillum. Now, I didn't hear much news about Buffalo trying to replace Reggie Gillum. I mean, he's still young. He's 24 years old. But they did sign him to a contract extension for two years through 2024. Uh, the deal was two years, $5.2 million. Um, he played 30 games in his career at Buffalo, five of which were actually in the playoffs. Uh, he was picked up as an undrafted free agent in 2020. Yes, he's very still he's still very young. And here's my opinion on this. I don't really think it was a bad deal re-signing Reggie Gillum, but I really wasn't too high on it. And here's why. I go back and I look at his stats. I go back and look at see and see the way he runs the ball. Now Obviously, the mentality of the fullback position, it's a required spot. You have to have one uh, on your roster. I come from a time where the fullbacks were just built different. The mentality of having a fullback was different. And what I mean by that is this. He's Reggie Gillum. He's 24 years old. He's 244 pounds. He's six foot tall. Um... He doesn't have a lot of stats behind it. He's got three free rushing yards, uh, one receiving touchdown, and he's just averaging over a year. He's been on the team for almost a couple of years now. but So he's not utilized um, very well. He's not utilized a lot, as you can tell. But they decided to extend him through uh, 2024. My mentality when it comes to the fullback position is this. When I grew up, the fullback position was more of, Let's say you're running a power eye formation, or if you're running a uh, two tailback set with a they call it a wishbone formation. At least they did when I played. You would have your wishbone formation. You would have so you would have your center. You would have your quarterback, and directly behind the quarterback, I would say probably about three yards with your fullback in a three point stance, and off to the left to the right of the fullback. If you're running a wishbone formation, uh, you would have your two tailbacks, which were about a yard and a half or so to max uh, back, drop back from the fullback. And they wouldn't be in a three-point stance. They'd be in a two-point stance. You know, their hands on their, uh, their knees or their upper thighs. It's just my mentality was back then and when I played, the fullback was your beef blocker. 
your beef. If you were going to run it up the gut, if you're going to run it off the off tackle, if you're going to run it off the end, your fullback was typically the guy that was your lead blocker if it was a run play. Now, you might have some counters and some crackback runs and misdirection. The fullback might go one way, the tailback might go the other. But for the most part, your fullback really never caught the ball, really never um, did jet sweeps, anything like that back when I played. Uh, when I grew up as a kid, I would watch players like Mike Allstop from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, or Jerome Bettis from the Pittsburgh Steelers, those fullbacks were just built different. Now, <laughs> surprisingly, uh, Reggie Gillum is 244 pounds. You know, when Mike Allstott and Jerome Bettis played, they're not much they're not much taller, but they're not much bigger than, Re than Reggie Gillum, but they're built different. Reggie Gillum is a slim... 244 pounds, six foot tall. I'm sure he's cut. And whereas if you look at Mike Olstop or Jerome Bettis and you saw those guys having coming through the line with the ball, it looked like a train coming through the station. With Reggie Gillum, uh, you don't get that. I go back and I look at times that he was involved and he was on a run play last year against Chicago. Yeah, see, that's where he had his receiving touchdown. Uh, in rushing touchdown, excuse me, a rushing touchdown. Uh, I just, you could see when he got the handoff, and it was from three yards out uh, in the red zone, and when he got the handoff, he immediately got stopped in his tracks and bounced off his left tackle, I believe it was. No, it was his left guard. He bounced off the left guard, and then he ended up running around uh, the right end for a touchdown. So, that mentality reminds me so much of a tailback, not a fullback, because I'm so used to the fullback just pounding it up the gut. If you need two yards on a handoff and you got to fight for those two yards in the end zone, typically your fullback is the guy that's going to blast it up the middle. So if you ever saw Mike Allstott or Jerome Bettis come through the middle with the, with the ball, you knew some people are going to get knocked out of the way. Some people are going to knock on their back. You knew it was going to be a bad day for you. But with that mentality nowadays in 2022, you really don't see that so much out of a fullback position. If I had to guess, well, I shouldn't guess it, but if I had to say in my opinion, Derrick Henry is built like a fullback for the Tennessee Titans. He's built like a fullback and runs like a tailback because he is a tailback. It's just impressive. You know, nowadays, what the fullback, um, the fullback position has transitioned to. Um, not necessarily opinion, but, you know, when you think about it, I'm sorry, not necessarily important to today's episode, but just a little bit more about the fullback position. If you're going to want to pick up a meaty fullback and you're going to want to pick up a guy that can pound it up the middle, Reggie Gillum's not going to be your guy. But then I think to myself, okay. The Buffalo Bills signed him for two years through 2024. It wasn't a long-term deal because really when you think about it, when you think about the Buffalo Bills, you don't think about a powerhouse run team. You think about Josh Allen and the wide receiver weapons that he actually has around him. And actually, which is very fitting because we're going to transition to the next segment, uh, which wide receivers I do not think and do think are going to make the final 53. Uh, so give me one second, guys, and we're going to drink some water, and we're going to talk about that. But, yeah, I, I just think in two years, I think Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean are going to change up the, the Buffalo Bills' identity. But for the next couple of years, with the weapons you have at wide receiver, you're obviously not – going to want to extend Reggie Gillum for five, six years, even though he's 24, because who knows where it'll be in two years? I mean, who knows where we're going to be at the end of the season? You know, hopefully we're holding up that Lombardi trophy, but I think it was kind of a good deal and not really a bad deal to only sign up for two years, because I think that was a good approach to take. I think Brandon Bean did the right thing when it came to Reggie Gillum's contract. Would I like a little bit more of a Mike Allstop, Jerome Bettis guy? Absolutely. But hey, We'll see how it plays out, uh, hopefully in our favor, guys. <clears throat> but 
let's talk about the main talking point of today's episode. And I do got some breaking news coming out of Buffalo, New York, so it's actually very fitting in regards to this. I'm still waiting to see if it's a final deal or not. But which wide receivers, in my opinion, do I think are going to make the final 53 and which ones I don't? Now, this depth chart is so deep. It's so deep. We got 11 guys on the roster, and when we're talking about wide receiver, unfortunately, not all 11 are going to make the team. It's a business. Some people are going to get cut. Some people are, uh, are not going to make the final 53. And uh, this is just me. I know I'm not a GM, but if it was me, I always look to see if I can get something for a player, some type of trade value, instead of just cutting them. One I'm not a big fan of having dead money on the salary books. I'm not a big fan of just cutting somebody for them to go to a team. I always feel that if you made it to the NFL, you're worth something in a trade. No, it might be not. It might not be much. It might be worth a seventh round pick. You know, but something for something. I'm always, I always believe in the negotiation mentality, and that is the job of a general manager is to negotiate with other GMs and try to get the best deal for their team, respectively. Uh, But I'm just not a fan of always cutting a player that doesn't make the final 53 or in general and having dead money. Because if you go back and you look on our books, we still have Cole Beasley that we're for dead money. You know, I, I mean, Cole Beasley, you know, as much as that exit happened with Cole Beasley and the Buffalo Bills, we could have got something for him. You know, it's not a lot of money in the, it's not a lot of money that's dead money. I'm sorry. It's not a lot of money that's dead money when it comes to Cole Beasley, but it's still dead money and it hurts us. So if it was me in that position, I would have dealt him somewhere that was definitely needing a wide receiver. Because right now, if you look at it, Cole Beasley is still looking for a team to play with. He hasn't even signed with somebody. We still owe him money, you know? If we at least would have traded him, he would have went somewhere and they would have picked up his contract. So, unfortunately, we're stuck with his uh, dead money for a little bit longer. Uh, But anyways, in my opinion, we have 11 wide receivers on this team. And which ones do I think uh, are going to make the final 53? Now, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the depth chart. I see all these guys that are so talented, so talented. We have Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Jamison Crowder, Isaiah McKenzie, Khalil Shakir, Tavon Austin, Isaiah Hodgins, Jake Kumaro, Marquez Stevenson. I'm going to talk about him in a second more. Tanner Gentry and Neil Powell. I can't pronounce his last name correctly, but 11 guys are fighting for a roster spot. Now, if it's me, I'm looking at the most obvious. Who's definitely going to make the team? Um... When I sit here and I look at it, okay, Stefan Diggs, he's in. He's a number one. Who's a number two guy? I look at Gabriel Davis. Gabriel Davis is a diamond in the rough. So if you guys um, play fantasy out there and you guys are looking for a top number two with the potential to be a number one, in my opinion, Gabriel Davis is a number one wide receiver. So if you guys are looking for a, a number two wide out uh, or even a number one, I would go with Gabriel Davis. He's going to be your guy. He's going to put up some big points for you guys in fantasy leagues. Um, and of course, so we have Jameson Crowder, um, Isaiah McKenzie, and Khalil Shakir. I, here's who I think makes the cut. Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, Khalil Shakir, because we just picked him up in the draft. I am very excited to see what Khalil Shakir could do. Uh, I watched highlights on him, on him out of Boise State. He reminds me <laughs> – how fitting is this? He reminds me of an Odell Beckham Jr. He was out there making one-handed catches, and uh, that's – we're getting closer to the breaking news uh, in regards to that situation. How fitting is this? Uh, then we have, in my opinion, I think Jake Kumaro makes a team. Uh Here's a surprise stunner. I think Isaiah Hodgins makes a team. And I think Jake, I'm sorry, excuse me, I think uh, Tanner Gentry makes a team. 
So there are your, in my opinion, seven that make the team. Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, Khalil Shakir, Jake Kumro, Isaiah Hodgins, and Tanner Gentry. I'm sorry, Tanner Gentry are going to make the team. And why do I say Tanner Gentry? Well, if you go back and you look at Tanner Gentry's um, college history, he actually played with Josh Allen in Wyoming. So I think that connection is going to be I think you're I think you're going to see the Wyoming um, Buffalo Bills connection there with Tanner Gentry. Uh, so there's my seven. So who's out? Jamison Crowder, I think, is going to be out. Tavon Austin's going to be out. Marquez Stevenson's going to be out. And Neil Powell, if I'm pronouncing his last name, is going to be out. And here's why. I just don't want to say someone's out without having some kind of argument or some kind of substance with backing it up. I look at Jamison Crowder. Jamison Crowder has been in the league for a while now. He's played with a couple different teams. He's played with the Jets. And he's not young, guys. Jamison Crowder is not young. He is 29 years old. Um, he's getting up there for age. And, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that's not old. He's 29 years old. Well, he's old when we're talking about football terms for a wide receiver position. He's 29 years old. He's got that veteran presence. I'm not saying he's a bad wide receiver. I'm just saying... Right now, at this time, the wide receiver depth chart is so deep, I don't think he's going to make the final 53. And if it's me, and I've already talked about this before, if it's me and I'm Bar uh, and if I'm Brandon Bean, excuse me, if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, what can I get for this guy? Does this guy still hold value? And in my opinion, he does. So I'm just not going to cut Jamison Crowder. Yes. We didn't sign him for a lot of money. I think he signed for a little over $1.5 million on the books. So he wasn't paid a lot of money to come to Buffalo. And he was supposed to replace – oh, God, I can't think about his name right now. I'm sorry. He was supposed to replace Emmanuel Sanders when Emmanuel Sanders retired. He was going to be the guy to fill in and, um, and take over that role. Now, he's not a bad wide receiver. Is he a number one? Is he a number one? No. Is he a number two? No. Is he a number three? Yeah, I think he's a number three when it comes to having him as a wide receiver, but only, only a number three on the right team. And unfortunately, with this wide receiver core being so deep, he's actually fallen, to my opinion, even though he's ranked as a number three. On the depth chart, in my opinion, with all the competition he has and all these guys that with all their skills and their youth, he's probably like a five or six, in my opinion. And unfortunately, that's where I think he's going to fall. Will he make the team? I don't know. I, in my opinion, I don't think he will make the team. But if it was me and I was in charge of Jamison Crowder's future with Buffalo, if I was Brandon Bean, I would think to myself, huh. My wide receiver core is so strong and so deep. And it's, there's a lot of youth on this team. What can I get for Jameson Crowder? And if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm going to say to myself, okay, I'm going to start looking around the NFL. And I'm going to start looking for teams that need wide receivers. Because right now, if I'm Brandon Bean and I'm paying attention, you would see that there are teams that are in desperate need of wide receivers right now. Even though, even though the regular season has not kicked off, there are teams around the NFL that are struggling with wide receivers right now because of injuries or suspensions. Now, if I trade a player, I never really want to trade him to A, the same division we play in, or the same conference if I can help it. Why? Because I don't want to later face that team down the season. I just I think that's going to come back and bite us unless – we can get a superstar player return that's in the same division or in the same conference. But if it was my if I if I had the choice, I would always prefer to trade somebody out of the conference to the NFC opposed to keep keeping them in the conference. And I'm gonna take a quick sip of water, guys. Sorry, I need to stay hydrated. It is very hot out here in southwest Missouri. <clears throat> But yeah, that's my opinion on <clears throat> excuse me, that's my opinion on Jameson Crowder. Let's trade him. 
where does he go? If I'm Brandon Bean, I'm looking around the NFL. Well, even though the Denver Broncos are hurting right now because they just lost their, their main guy in Tim Patrick. Tim Patrick at wideout is going to be out the entire season with a torn ACL injury. Um, that's a possibility to trade him to the Denver Broncos. But when you think about it, you're really not going to get much in return for Jamison Crowder if you send him off to Denver. Okay, You might be able to get a fifth round, fourth round, but I just don't think Jameson Crowder would go to Denver if we traded him. Now, there are two teams, in my opinion, that I think would be strong suits for a trade for Jameson Crowder. I'm talking about the Chicago Bears and the Arizona Cardinals, and here's why. The Arizona Cardinals are going to be out their superstar, uh, Larry Fitzgerald, for six games due to suspension. That is going to be a massive blow for the Cardinals. So they're desperate. They're going to be desperate for a wide receiver, a superstar wide receiver. Now, is Jameson Crowder a superstar wide receiver? No. Can he step in and fill the, uh, fill the shoes of a Larry Fitzgerald? Not really 100%, but he can fill the shoes, and it won't be as bad as not having Larry Fitzgerald. Now, I always think to myself, they're the most desperate team right now. The Arizona Cardinals are hurting for guys. Uh, also, the, the Bears are hurting for guys. So if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm calling up the GM from Chicago, uh, and I'm be like, look, hey, man, let's make a deal. Okay, you guys got some serious problems going on right now with the wide receiver group. If I'm Brandon Bean, I'm telling Brian Poles, the GM over there in Chicago, look, I got Jamison Crowder. I'm willing to make a deal with you guys. I know you guys obviously got the cap space because the Chicago Bears, they have just over, I think I want to say it's not a Bears fan, but they got over just $18 million in cap space. So can they afford... To bring on a Jamison Crowder? Absolutely. But is there a need for Jamison Crowder? And I honestly, I think the Chicago Bears uh, definitely need to bring in Jamison Crowder for a trade with Buffalo. Here's why. Nikhil Harry. He suffered an apparent severe ankle injury during Saturday, Saturday's practice, but he's also waiting further evaluation on that. You also look at... Uh, Bellis Jones Jr. And Jones did not practice for a second straight day because of an undisclosed injury. So we've already got two wide receivers on the Bears that are banged up. So the Bears might be very desperate to bring in Crowder. And here is another reason. You got Byron Pringle. You know, he's dealing with a uh, quadriceps injury that could keep him out for a while. So you guys got... Three, these are the reports I'm reading. You've got three wide receivers that are banged up right now on the Bears, and the regular season hasn't even started. So if I'm telling myself, if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm looking for the team that is really struggling the most for wide receiver. Who's banged up? Who can I trade? Who can I get rid of? And honestly, in my opinion, I would trade Jameson Crowder to the Chicago Bears. I think that would be a good pickup for the Bears as well. And Personally, in my opinion, I think we can get a good deal for Jameson Crowder because uh, we're not going to get a first-round pick for Jameson Crowder. We're not going to get a second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. But in my opinion, I think we can probably get a th maybe a third-round pick. Now, here's the thing on this, too. This ties in with Marquez Stevenson. Uh, Marquez Stevenson is hurt again. He's a speedy wide receiver out of Houston. We got him from uh, – he played college in Houston. Uh, he was hurt last season too. This guy reminds me of a Isaiah McKenzie. When I, when I talk about Marquez Stevenson, the guy's got so much, so much speed. But unfortunately, the guy has not been able to stay healthy. Um, he got hurt last year, and now he's hurt again this year. And he hasn't even seen – 
uh, a lot of playing time when it comes to Buffalo, I, and it's it's heartbreaking because this kid, this kid's fast, fast, but he can't stay healthy. Um, if it was me and I was Brandon Bean, I would try to make a deal with Buffalo. Uh, excuse me, I would try to make a deal with Chicago, and I would try to trade uh, Jamison Crowder and Marquez Stevenson to the Chicago Bears. Now. That might bump it up to a second round pick for the 2023 uh, draft. So what do you do? You open up two wide receiver slots. They go to the Bears because the Bears are are desperate for wide receivers. Um, You get Jameson Crowder, which if you send him over there now to Chicago, he could be a good number two wide receiver, maybe a number three, but he could be a strong number two for the Bears. Uh, Then you can take Marquez Stevenson. And you can make him a special teams player because he's already technically a special teams player now for Buffalo on the books. But then you have Isaiah McKenzie, so there really wouldn't be a need for Marquez Stevenson to be a special teams player when we can just take Isaiah McKenzie and put him back there for punt returns and kick returns like we have in the past. Uh, So I really think by trading Jamison Crowder and Marquez Stevenson to the Bears, you're going to get a good deal for that trade, and I'm thinking somewhere in the ballpark of a maybe a second to third round pick for a 2023 uh, draft pick for the Bills, and I think that's I think that's fair. I really do. You're not going to get a number one pick. You're not going to get. You might get the number two, but I, I would say a number three for sure. But that's my opinion on Jameson Crowder and the Marquez Stevenson injury. Who knows? They might end up making the team. I could be completely wrong. It's not like I've never been wrong before because I have been. Um, I thought Quentin Morris was going to make the team, and it looks like he's not going to do that uh, for tight end. But, hey, you know, it is what it is. Um, but th- that's my opinion. And and the beauty about having my opinion is, look, you guys don't have to agree with my opinion. You don't have to disagree with it. It's I just ask that you respect it and be courteous and respectful about my, about my opinion because I'm going to be respectful about yours. Um, but moving on, I still think when you look at it, that frees up two spots. You got Tavon Austin. Now, Tavon Austin, he's been in the league for a while now as well. Now, I'm sorry, a while now. And I don't think Tavon Austin is going to make the team. I just don't. You look at all the youth you have uh, – as far as Jake, well, I shouldn't say this, but kind of, it's kind of going to contradict what I'm saying. Uh, you look at Jake Kumaro, he's 30 years old, and he's older. <laughs> he's older than Jameson Crowder, but why would I keep Jake Kumaro over Jameson Crowder? This guy is built. He's a beast. He's a beast. He's 6'4", 209 pounds. He's a tall guy. So if you're looking for that wide receiver, or if you got Josh Allen that wants to put him in the back corner, you want a wide receiver that can go up and get it? It's Jake Kumro. That's why I say keep keep Jake Kumro. He's a good wide receiver. Uh, he's tall. He's lengthy. He's the type of guy you want for a tall wide receiver that can go up and get in the top hand of uh, the top corner. It definitely makes it tough for cornerbacks to try to knock the ball down and intercept it. So Jake Kumro, I think, in my opinion, is going to be a lock. We had him on the team before. He went to the Saints. Came back, but I'm glad we got him. Uh, and Neil Paul, I just really haven't heard much out of him. I've been trying to follow up with him on uh, the practices. I haven't heard anything bad about him, but I also haven't heard anything good about him. So I don't know what I think about Neil Paul. I just don't think he's going to make the team because looking at the depth chart, he's all the way back to fourth string, and it's a deep fourth string, guys. He is he's the last man on totem pole, so I don't think he's going to make the team. So, brings me to this. We have breaking news coming out of Buffalo, New York. If you guys haven't heard right now, Von Miller, these are the rumors that are going on right now. Von Miller has been trying to recruit, that's right, superstar wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. to the Buffalo Bills. Now, it is rumored that Odell Beckham Jr. is highly interested in coming to Buffalo. Now, I know what some of you people are thinking. You guys are like, no, I don't want Odell Beckham Jr. to come to Buffalo. He's a crybaby. He's a whiner. I don't want him. Nope. I don't want him. He's hurt. He got injured last year. Look, 
here's my take on this. If you're going to trade Jamison Crowder and you're going to trade um, Marquez Stevenson, you're going to have to open up the slot. You're going to have to open up uh, – that opens up the spot, excuse me, for a Odell Beckham Jr. to come in and play. That's just another superstar wide receiver for Josh Allen to play with. Uh, come on. Just picture it for a second. Can you imagine this? And I know for a lot of you guys out there, it's hard to believe. But looking at the depth chart now, just imagine this. Odell Beckham Jr. signs with Buffalo. You would have Odell Beckham Jr., Stephon Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, Khalil Shakir, Jake Kumaro, and then at this point now, we have to decide who to get rid of, Tanner, Den Tanner Gentry or Isaiah Hodgins. And then I'm going to say Isaiah Hodgins is out. Can you imagine that? Those four, the top four wide receivers in the NFL are going to be Odell Beckham Jr., Stephon Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Isaiah McKenzie, it, and, and Odell Beckham Jr. That is amazing. That is just incredible. That's scary. If I'm the other teams around the NFL, I'm thinking to myself, that is a scary group. Now, here's the thing. That's going to force a lot of defenses to change up, uh, whether they're going to play zone or cover one, cover two, uh, cover three. Uh, they're going to play either a nickel formation. Uh, you don't know. What do you play against those guys? What formation do you play? Do you play a 3-4, two safeties, one safety? What do you play? What do you play on defense if you are going up against the Buffalo Bills and they have a Stephon Diggs, <laughs> Gabriel Davis, Odell Beckham Jr., and Isaiah McKenzie? They're going to beat you every which way. It reminds me so much about the Chiefs. From last year. The Chiefs, they could beat you many different ways when they had Tyree Kill. Oh, not to mention, we had Dawson Knox to a tight end. And OJ Howard. If this team does not win the Super Bowl this year, this season is a complete bust. Come on. Come on, guys. But they remind me this year, the Bills remind me so much about the Chiefs from last year and previous years with Mahomes. You had Mahomes, you had Tyreek Hill, you had Travis Kelsey, you had Byron Pringle, you had Josh Gordon on that team. You guys, they could beat you so many different ways. Edwards Alaire running back. I know he's not a wide receiver, but this team reminds me so much about how the Chiefs were for previous two, three seasons. And if the Bills do not win the Super Bowl this year, it's going to be a complete bust. But I am looking for some more news in regards to the Odell Beckham Jr. news. Um, but right now, it's if you go on the uh, CBS Sports website, you will see that Von Miller tweeted and Instagrammed a picture of Odell Beckham Jr. wearing number three. Uh, and it's getting a lot of it's getting a lot of eyes looking that direction, guys. And I don't like the number because. If you know anything about Bill's franchise history, who wore number three last, EJ Manuel. And I'm not a big fan of EJ Manuel. Um, never cared for EJ Manuel, but <laughs> it's it's getting a lot of news, guys. So hopefully, um, I'm hopefully we see Odell Beckham Jr. come to Buffalo. And if Odell Beckham Jr. comes to Buffalo. It's going to be big shock waves through Western New York. So, and all the articles I'm reading and all the articles I'm seeing is he still plans on coming to Buffalo. And you know what? How fitting would that be? Von Miller, a Super Bowl champion. Odell Beckham Jr., a Super Bowl champion, comes to Buffalo and they turn around and go back to the Super Bowl to play the team they won a Super Bowl with. Because that's my Super Bowl prediction, guys. I firmly believe the Buffalo Bills and the Los Angeles Rams are going to be the Super Bowl this year. So, 
what a story. And, you know, it's amazing because we start off the regular season week one against the Rams as well. But that's today's episode, guys. Episode four, Surviving the Cut, the wide receiver edition. You guys heard my opinions on which wide receivers I think are going to make the final 53 and which ones don't. And it's going to be very, very interesting here in the next upcoming hours, days, weeks to see what happens with uh, Odell Beckham Jr. situation. But other than that, guys, I am out of time. Join me next week for episode five of the Bison Pride podcast. I am your host, Sean Predmore. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the 417 Mafia, Buffalo Bills backers of Southwest Missouri, Wally Charbonneau, Matt Puccio, Christopher James, David Weinstaff, and I. Thank you all so much for listening to the episode today, guys. Join us August 20th out of Big Whiskey Sports Bar and Grill in Springfield, Missouri for week two against the Denver Broncos of the preseason. Come out, have a good time. Meet the co-founders of the group, and uh, we'll just have a blast, guys. Other than that, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you guys have a safe, wonderful, wonderful week. And take care, love each other, and goodbye, guys. I'll see you next week.